Welcome, everyone. Today, we'll be talking about part one of a series on imprinting disorders. We'll be talking about Prater Willi and Angelman syndromes. And today's talk will be given by Sophia Dayarda. She's a UCSF genetic counseling student. So, Sophia, take it away. Thank you, Daniel. So, we're starting off this lecture with an overview of imprinting disorders. These are a class of genetic conditions that arise due to changes in imprinted regions of our DNA. What do we mean when we refer to imprinted regions, imprinted DNA, or imprinted chromosomes? Well, we all inherit two copies of every chromosome, one set paternally and one set maternally, and some of our genes are only expressed from either the maternal or the paternal allele. Oftentimes, this differential expression is achieved through DNA methylation, either on or near the gene, sometimes in nearby sites known as imprinting control centers or imprinting control regions. So when we say that chromosome 15 is imprinted, we mean that it contains genes that are differentially expressed according to parental origin due to methylation patterns. This parental-specific gene expression occurs because the chromosomes and gametes have sex-specific methylation patterns. So oocytes have maternal-specific methylation patterns, and the chromosomes in spermatid have paternal-specific methylation patterns. And we inherit the balance of expression from both of these to achieve a healthy outcome. One additional note here is that imprinted this does not necessarily mean methylated, and methylated does not necessarily mean not expressed. Rather, when a chromosome is imprinted, there is methylation on either the paternal or maternal allele, and this results in different gene expression from each allele. And we'll look more closely at what this means for prater willi syndrome and Angelman syndrome in just a few slides. And the reason why we're presenting both of these conditions in today's lecture is because these are like two sides of the same coin. What we mean by that is that different changes at the same locus, the 15Q11.2 to Q13 region, also referred to as the prater willi critical region, can result in either prater willi syndrome or Angelman syndrome. This locus contains many imprinted genes, on the right, we see sort of a simplified representation of this region, and you can see how some genes will only be expressed from the paternal allele and others from the maternal allele, and we'll look more closely at that in just a moment. Here's a glance at the prevalence of these two conditions. You can see that they're both rare diseases with kind of similar prevalence. One note here is that the literature has some mixed evidence on whether the occurrence of Angelman syndrome increases with the use of assisted reproductive technologies like IVF. Some studies have shown that these assisted reproductive technologies increase the prevalence of Angelman syndrome, while other studies have disputed this evidence. It is just important to know for reference that this is an area of active research. Now, getting into the clinical features of these two conditions, both of these conditions require multidisciplinary care, but they have very different clinical features. Starting with prater willi syndrome, some of the hallmark features are in infancy, extreme hypotonia and feeding difficulties. This may require parents to seek support from nutritional consultations. Then a sort of switch occurs in childhood through adulthood to excessive eating, which is hyperphagia, which can lead to morbid obesity if not regulated or monitored. This can also lead to hypo hypothyroidism, which can be monitored by an endocrinologist. Unsupervised access to food should be avoided for these individuals for that reason. And again, nutritional consultation can be important to monitor those eating habits throughout different life stages. These individuals have global developmental delays and benefit from educational support and behavior therapy. Individuals with prater willi syndrome do not typically live independently. Many individuals have hypogonadism, growth hormone deficiency, and central adrenal insufficiencies, which again can all be monitored by endocrinology. Some individuals have dysmorphic bases, such as narrow forehead and almond-shaped palpebral fissures. And there is some evidence that individuals with prater willi syndrome may have a shortened lifespan, although there's no clear consensus on by how much. Now, moving on to Angelman syndrome, these individuals have a different set of clinical features that can be characterized as a spectrum of neurologic features. 
These individuals have severe developmental delay and intellectual disability, so independent living is not possible. Indiv individuals with Angelman syndrome experience seizures, which can be evaluated by neurologists. Most individuals have gait ataxia and motor delays and benefit from physical therapy or orthopedic evaluations. Most individuals also have microcephaly and some will have other dysmorphic features such as a wide mouth. The lifespan for Angelman syndrome may be unaltered. For both prater willi and Angelman syndrome, there may be ongoing clinical trials for treatments that may help to alleviate some of these features. Now we're moving on to looking closer at the genetic causes of these two conditions. So it's helpful to start with a global view of the imprinting or methylation pattern of our region of interest, which again is the prater willi critical region. In unaffected individuals, the paternal allele is unmethylated and expresses many genes of which the SNRPIN and SNORD116 are perhaps the most studied or understood. The maternal allele is methylated at the imprinting control region and expresses fewer genes, but importantly expresses the UBE3A gene. The expression of UBE3A is critical in neurons and this sort of correlates to that spectrum of neurologic features that we just discussed for Angelman syndrome. Uh, molecular or genetic changes that result in loss of paternal gene expression may result in prater willi syndrome, while on the flip side, changes that result in loss of maternal gene expression may result in Angelman syndrome. So it can be helpful to keep this in mind moving forward. Here's an example of one such change this figure represents a deletion of the prater willi critical region on the paternal allele, so that might result in prater willi syndrome, like we explained a moment ago. And on the flip side, deletion of the prater willi critical region on the maternal allele may result in Angelman syndrome. And now getting into the other genetic etiologies for both conditions, the most common molecular and genetic cause of both Prader-Willi syndrome and Angelman syndrome is a deletion of the Prader-Willi critical region, like we just saw in those two examples. Another cause of both conditions is uniparental dysemy, or UPD. This is a phenomenon that occurs when a person inherits both copies of a chromosome from either the paternal or maternal side. In the case of these conditions, instead of inheriting one chromosome 15 from the egg and one chromosome 15 from the sperm, if a person inherits two chromosome 15s from the egg or two chromosome 15s from the sperm, they will have maternal UPD or paternal UPD um, of chromosome 15. And this can occur for many reasons, including trisomy rescue or monosomy rescue or mitotic crossing over. Other causes of both prater willi syndrome and Angelman syndrome include like imprinting de defects, such as imprinting center deletions. And for Angelman syndrome, there is also an added uh, consideration of single gene pathogenic variants in the UBE3A gene. And these make up for about 11% of Angelman cases. Another thing to note here is that for Angelman syndrome, there is no detectable genetic or molecular etiology in about 10% of cases. And here we're looking at how a deletion of the prater willi critical region may arise, since this is the most common cause of both conditions. We're looking again at that prater willi critical region, but we've added a little bit more information. So the brown stars with the letters BP underneath them represent breakpoints. And the prater willi critical region is flanked by multiple of these breakpoints. These contain DNA sequences that have low copy repeats that are homologous to each other. So during meiosis, the two pairs of chromosome 15 may have non-homologous pairing due to these low copy repeats, and this can result in a crossover event. There are two outcomes of that. One copy receives a duplication of the region, while the other receives a deletion of the region. And the chromosome with the deletion can be inherited by an offspring and result in either prater willi syndrome or Angelman syndrome, depending on whether this occurred to the paternal or the maternal chromosome. The deletion tends to encompass a five to six megabase region, 
And the figure in this slide depicts a deletion arising in the paternal allele, which again would lead to prater willi syndrome. But like we said, the same molecular mechanism can occur to the maternal allele and result in Angelman syndrome if inherited. For prater willi syndrome, the diagnosis is, is established by molecular testing. However, the presence of clinical features is used to justify the ordering of molecular testing. Any of the molecular or genetic findings from the previous slides that we discussed establishes a diagnosis of prater willi syndrome. For Angelman syndrome, molecular testing also establishes a diagnosis. However, because like we mentioned before, 10% of Angelman patients have uh, negative molecular or genetic testing, a diagnosis may also be established by clinical criteria. And the clinical criteria is divided into these consistent, frequent, and associated features. And here is a visual representation of a testing strategy, and we're going to walk through it. So beginning with DNA methylation analysis and oligo SNP array, if the testing returns with only detecting the paternal unmethylated imprint, then this would confer an Angelman syndrome diagnosis. It's recommended to follow up with additional testing to understand exactly what is causing that result, whether it's UPD or another imprinting defect. Similarly, if the initial testing returns with only detecting the maternal methylated imprint, then this would confer a prater willi diagnosis. Um, but again, you may want to follow up with additional testing to identify the exact cause. And if the initial testing returns normal, then a diagnosis of prater willi syndrome is considered to be very unlikely. And here we have a similar representation of testing strategy for Angelman syndrome. It's very similar to what we just saw. The main differences here is that the initial test is only that DNA methylation analysis. And there's also an extra step here of ordering UBE 3A gene testing if the methylation analysis is normal. And also, like we discussed earlier, even if all the testing returns normal, you can still turn to clinical diagnostic criteria to establish the Angelman syndrome diagnosis, since 10% of those patients will have negative testing. One of the important counseling considerations is recurrence risk to siblings. But most cases of both prater willi syndrome and Angelman syndrome are usually de novo. So the recurrence risk to siblings is usually less than 1%. However, it's certainly possible that an unaffected parent could harbor a genetic change that results in either prater willi syndrome or Angelman syndrome in their child. This slide kind of lists some of those genetic changes that may be inherited from unaffected parents. In these cases, the recurrence risk to siblings is higher and depends exactly on the genetic etiology. In the image on the slide, we see an example of a father who may have had a de novo balanced translocation involving chromosome 15, and one possible outcome is his offspring inheriting an unbalanced translocation involving a deletion of that prater willi critical region on the paternal allele, and then resulting in prater willi syndrome. In this case, the empirical data shows a recurrence risk of up to 25%. And to conclude this presentation, I'd just like to present some helpful resources for families affected by both prater willi syndrome and Angelman syndrome. These are both conditions that can be intense for parents, caregivers, and other family members because of the extent of support that is required. So these are great organizations that offer resources for families. They organize conferences and summit meetings, and they provide information on ongoing research. So these can be helpful to provide a sense of community to affected families. And that concludes this lecture on prater willi and Angelman syndromes. If you have, if you found this lecture helpful, or if you have any other feedback, please let Daniel know. Also, make sure to catch up on the study rare newsletters that will be covering these conditions and other imprinting disorders, and we'll be presenting you with some board style questions on these topics. Wonderful. Thank you, Sophia, so much for that presentation.